Robert Plant. Off the Record with Mary Turner, brought to you by Budweiser, the king of beers. For all you do, this Bud's for you. Atari Soft, now the greatest arcade hits fits your home computer. And Levi's Jeanswear, Levi Strauss & Company, official outfitter of the 1984 U.S. Olympic team. Robert Plant, Off the Record. Did it take you a while after Bonzo's death to come forth with the idea that you have a lot more to do? Was there ever a point when you thought... Oh yeah, obviously there was a point. He and I always used to talk, and he used to say, whatever, you, whatever happens along the way, you've got to keep singing, you know, you must keep singing. And I used to say the same thing to him, because we were kids together, playing when we were 15 and stuff. And I sat around for quite a long time, and then I realised that it would be unfair of myself to myself. And his old lady said the same thing to me, you know, Pat said, you've got to, you've got to keep singing. And so the only way to really do it would be to do it alone because he and I were so tight and the band was so tight back then that I just had to go off and start completely fresh. Hence the video, hence the different albums, hence the fact that Principle of Moments is another departure altogether from Pixar to Eleven. I mean, it's far more ambitious and uh, <laughs> exciting, I think. So, I mean, it's really a case of um, having come to that conclusion, it's best put forward. No one will ever forget his 12 years with Led Zeppelin. And if things go as planned, no one will ever forget his years as a solo artist. Robert Plant, a man determined to make music for the present and the future. I'm Mary Turner, and this is a look at the legend. Robert Plant, off the record. Led Zeppelin was retired in 1980 with the death of John Bonham. After a number of months of inactivity, Robert Plant decided to start making music again. He teamed up with guitarist Robbie Blunt, and they became the Honey Drippers. What came first, the tunes, the tunes that were on Pictures at 11, or did you just say, hey, you want to have a play? Oh, yeah, it all just came from just getting together in the first place. Robbie had got a lot of chords stored away from his work that he'd done in the past with notorious outfits who hadn't got room for melody. He'd worked with Stan Webb and Chicken Shack, which seems to be an extension of Alcoholics Anonymous, really, <laughs> with a van, with a truck and some equipment. You know? And um, it was all based around the 12-bar blues thing. So whatever he'd written or put on tape that was pretty didn't really find a place. And all of a sudden, uh, he found a sort of softy like me who was ready to sort of chew it up and give it some lyrics and some melody. It must have been difficult for you writing with a different writing partner after all those years. Well, I have said it was. I don't think it was in the long run. I think it was really... I got a lot of frustrations off my chest because having decided to get on and do it, taking it to the honey drippers to their ultimate conclusion, which was yet another branch of Alcoholics Anonymous or whatever it was, it was obvious that I had to... I wanted to create that kind of mood and intensity again. And so I was really flooring, you know, clutching straws in a way, because I had to get it out of me. So it wasn't that hard. It was a bit like um, coming back from the Foreign Legion and finding a woman still waiting, you know. What kind of places did you play with the Honey Drippers, for a start? Oh, small bars and clubs, similar sort of thing that you'd get in Texas or New York. But very low-key. I mean, nobody knew who, that I was anything to do with it. And really, fortunately, I've I have the kind of atmosphere or projected atmosphere around me that nobody really took that much notice because I've, it's come to the acceptance now in England a little bit that people just expect me to do that sort of thing along with what I do on a sort of more uh, emotional level, you know. So we did a TV thing in England like 10 days ago which was a failure in front of a live audience and um, the kids were shouting and screaming and all that sort of thing, which I was quite shocked about. I haven't, I've forgotten about that. And the amazing thing was that there was no... Because of Pictures at Eleven and because of the new album being very close to coming out, I thought this is going to be the beginning, the first test of whether people will shout for Stairway to Heaven, which I was loathing. But they didn't, they shouted for Honey Dripper's songs instead, which is quite fun, you know. That's great. Yeah, it was great. Robert Plant's second solo effort is The Principle of Moments. When we come back, Plant talks about why he needed to make this album even more adventurous than the first, off the record. I'm Mary Turner. You had an interesting quote in a little uh, English thing, fanzine kind of thing, commenting on how punks 
set them, so they, they knocked down what they would have called dinosaur rock. Yeah. You know? Only to join the rank. Yeah. Mm. Well, uh, really, that's the way of all flesh. Well, it's I mean, circular, isn't true, it? True, yeah. I mean, there's nothing uh, derogatory in that. It really is a case of as the best survive and come through and give and yield and submit themselves yes. for uh, sort of general scrutiny. Well, how does it feel if you're, if you're, say, Led Zeppelin, who's sold, what, 30, 40 million albums, and some young bozo comes along and starts slagging you for being popular? Well, I, I think that really I just got to smile and give it, let them have a bit of time, because that young bozo will fall on his face, and he'll probably never aspire beyond the sort of local newspaper that he, he expresses himself in once a week. He might be rehearsing and practicing on the guitar for the other six days but nobody knows that. There's a lot of it about. So you're spending years and years and years and able to make the transition? It appears so. I mean, with Pictures at 11, I was really expecting critical uh, holocaust. But uh, I received a lot of good comments, especially in the English press, which was the one I sort of bled to without saying a word, you know. So here we go. I've done it now. <laughs> I've left myself wide open. But even the, the sort of journalists that I expected the worst from picked up on the parts that were interesting and were an improvement on my, on my part. I was singing better. I actually do sing now. And if you have to put that down to maturity or being around too long, well, that's fine. I think I'll go with that. I wear bright clothes, though. <laughs> <laughs> You've changed your look a lot. Are you an instantly recognizable figure in England? Well, not where I live now, <laughs> I don't think. Uh, Are you out in the country? Mm, well, I have. Past lunch, in fact. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I don't think so. I mean, where I'm staying now, it's, there are very few young people anyway. It's an area where there are other rock and rollers who've gone into the hills. Uh, this is what, so nobody really takes a lot of notice. But in, in the, when I go into the cities, I get the occasional, when are you going to do this, or when are you going to do that, or when are you coming to such and such? I don't take notes. But it still happens. I suppose the change of look has to be anyway. Well, one does evolve, mm -hmm. I guess. Yeah, well, you can't go wandering around looking like a sort of Botticelli print for the rest of your life. <laughs> In the 70s, Robert Plant inspired thousands of teenagers to wear their hair long, their jeans tight, and their mysticism on their sleeves. Then they spent countless days and nights learning Led Zeppelin songs note for note. Plant says he did the same thing when he was a kid, sort of. When we come back, Robert talks about his musical heroes, off the record. Robert Plant, born in England, raised on Motown. Coming up next, off the record. I'm Mary Turner. So your first love musically was blues, wasn't it? Well, yeah, anything that made you stop. I mean, it could be, I suppose it was the rhythm and blues really to begin with that got me into blues sideways, if you like. And early Miracle stuff, Smokey Robinson stuff. Shop around? Shop around and get a job and all that sort of thing. I bought a cassette yesterday, compilation of all the Miracles hits, which I've already got on record, but I knew it on tape immediately because of the things like, what's so good about Goodbye? And yeah. how can Farewell be fair? Yeah. My favorite Whoa, song of all yeah. time. I know. <laughs> well, when I was a kid, you see, <clears throat> these records didn't, weren't hits in England, but the amount of play that they got was very minimal because it was all sponsored radio on the on the pirate station. But at the time, I mean, to me, it was such a pure voice, Smokey Robinson. And that, all that stuff came out on, we had a label in England called London American, which distributed lots of minor American labels. And on that label, there were loads of things, Watch Your Step by Bobby Parker, and sort of Tina Turner stuff, Charlie and Ines Fox. And listening to that, a lot of the New Orleans, Chris Kenner and Bobby March and the Clans, and all that sort of thing, coming into my little sort of untried imagination really spurred me and so taking that and listening to it and, and inquiring upon that you came across Buddy Guy and Muddy Waters and How and Wolf and then back further and back further and back to Robert Johnson and Charlie Patton and all that and before you knew where you were you had more or less the log of the Enterprise you could go from 1923 to, to 19 whatever it was 63 and you could see 40 years of progression of music that really was emotional, you know, it was really... What right I had to try and contribute to it in any way, I don't really know. Now I think I have a right, but maybe when I was a kid, I was just 
turned on. What are you proudest of, of the Zeppelin days? Physical graffiti in Togo. I mean, that was the nicest thing. You know, because it was so diverse, it went from one extreme to another. It really epitomised why we weren't a heavy rock band or a hard rock band. We were just sort of unusual combination of musicians. Really. And if anybody ever says, puts us in a category with other groups who didn't have that kind of quality, I don't think any other band really did have that, belong to that kind of position in it all. Then I say, well, listen to that then. Listen to In the Light and then Want and Song. Custard Pie and then Down by the Seaside. And you, cut, you stick all those things together on two albums, the sort of diversity, and you, you've got a summary of what we were all about. Looking back on those years, on the Zeppelin years, if there was one thing you could change, aside from Bones, or of course, what would it be? I wouldn't change anything. Yeah? Not a thing. Boy, that's an interesting commentary. Mm -hmm. That's great. Well, you take it as it comes. Every day is a new day, and that was how it was with, with Zeppelin. That's how it is with me. You, you can't start moaning about how mature you were when you made this decision or when you did that or when you did the other. You just do it. And uh, if you start analysing it too much or condemning different aspects of it, then you, you're very likely not to take another step forward. I think I might have had just a little bit more fun than I did. It's hard to imagine. You got it all wrong. <laughs> really? Really? <laughs> I was always very conscientious. Being the singer, I had no choice, really. I wasn't in bed by about two in the morning. I couldn't sing the next night anyway. Do you anticipate that you guys might ever play again? Maybe just for fun? Uh, well, I'd like to play with Jimmy again sooner or later. I mean, but I want to do things now that are uncomplicated. And really taking this thing off and being my own worst enemy. By tiptoeing or or plod hopping through all the past sort of uh, standard is exciting and I've got nothing to lose. Working with Jimmy again would create a whole sort of return to, I don't know, we'd be, both be like the prisoners of Zender again, you know? And uh, then the two of us on stage would give people the right to demand Black Dog and stuff like that. Oh, you're right about that. And at least with the setup now, it would be so it would be absolutely wrong for the audience to expect anything because it would make the musicians I'm playing with like sort of cabaret artists mm -hmm. backing the singer and that's not how it is, you know. These guys cannot get up and play Kashmir as much as I love it and as much as they might like it because it's not part of the present thing and they are not musicians who have to do other people's songs. They've written these songs and they're really good songs. Moroccan Rock and Roll, coming up next on Robert Plant, Off the Record. I'm Mary Turner. How about Moonlight and Samosa? You're a world traveler, aren't you? Mm-hmm. I think Moonlight and Samosa just carries on the threads of a kind of an emotive theme that's been around me since what is and what should never be. And uh, maybe Black Country Woman and one or two other songs. It's the same, if you were to weave a cloth or whatever it is, then the same sort of colours and emotions are in that song as we're in the other ones. Same person is referred to. You like uh, Moroccan or Arabic kind of things, huh? Mm -hmm. You've been there a lot, mm -hmm. that area of the world? Yes, great place. What drew you there initially? Uh, well, I suppose it's very simple. I mean, living in England, there's very little sun. And going to Morocco seems to be the nearest place where you could be guaranteed a a total culture shock and uh, very simple things, nice weather and stuff like that. But I mean, as soon as I got there, I realized there was far more here as a culture that really, although the northern part of Morocco and the northern part of North Africa lent very heavily on, on Europe and the kind of European traditions and, and traits. As soon as you got past Achilles' last stand and south into the desert, you got in amongst the Berber tribesmen and all that sort of thing, you found that the, the, the honesty, the sort of magnitude of these people was phenomenal. So from that moment on, I've always been in love with it and read lots of books on travellers and all that sort of thing and get completely carried away with a sort of uh, simplicity and harsh reality, but very warm honesty of the people. It's been a great experience. You can speak their language? A little bit. Really? Boy, good for you. Only a little bit. It seems kind of a frightening place to go, though. No, no, no. Really? No, no. Perfectly safe? 
As long as you can smile, yeah. Oh. <laughs> like most new artists, Robert Plant is making videos to accompany his albums, but his reasons for hitting the screen are personal rather than professional. I suppose, really, with the, the completion of a record, you never really consider whether or not there should even be a necessity for a single, the whole sort of mechanics of um, the game never even come into consideration. But as you get near completion, you start to go, oh, that's pretty, you know, that's nice. It's got a lot of air to it and a lot of space. This song is possibly the song that could open up the whole appreciation or comprehension of what I do. And obviously, to take that to the nth degree, to the ultimate point, these days it appears that you have to go into the world of video, or you don't have to. I mean, I may consider it a little trite, and perhaps the whole movement just a little bit too much like indigestion. But if you can turn up with something that's really nice, that um, pictorially it becomes an accessory to the music, then, especially in my position, because people have, have a, if people remember my work from the past, before Pictures at 11, then they have a preconceived notion of me. And I suppose I would like to put that while in the past. So really? Mm -hmm. it's de I mean, it's something to be proud of, though. Oh, sure, definitely to be proud of. I couldn't be more proud, you know, but I have this definite conception that I have a, a lot more to do. And if it takes this sort of platform to open people's eyes to the fact that I'm not whatever their notions are, then this is the way to do it. Robert Plant, Off the Record with Mary Turner, has been brought to you by Budweiser, the king of beers. For all you do, this Bud's for you. Atari Soft, now the greatest arcade hits fit your home computer. And Levi's Jeanswear, Levi Strauss and Company, official outfitter of the 1984 U.S. Olympic team. This special program was written and produced by Marsha Richardson. Production and engineering by Bill Levy and Ron Harris. Off the Record with Mary Turner is a presentation of Westwood One. Executive producer, Norm Pattis.